Hey everybody, welcome back to Retro Console Mining News. There's a ton of news to go over this week, so let's just get right into it. Let's start off with a story that caused a little bit of controversy this week. Sentient6 tweeted that it seems Crix found a hardware issue with the EverDrives that was kind of causing the analog pocket incompatibilities. Any Game Boy EverDrives produced after 1228 of last year work better with the pocket. It seems that any Game Boy EverDrives with problems that were manufactured before that may not be able to be fixed on Crix's side. The controversial part was the second part of Sentient6's tweet here, where they were talking about if yours was made before that date, try to seek any return or replacement options, which kind of rubbed some people the wrong way. Whoever originally sold those Game Boy EverDrives had no knowledge that they were going to be not compatible with the Pocket, so it's a little bit unfair for those sellers to have to deal with this issue. However, I talked to Sentient6 in my Discord, and they mentioned that Crix was allowing people to exchange their EverDrives for newer ones, but I'm assuming that's probably right around that purchase date. So maybe if you purchased one right before the new hardware refresh, you might be able to get the newer one. However, there's still more to that Game Boy EverDrive situation. It seems that Crix found the issue with the Pocket sort of sending the wrong pulses at the wrong place, causing the EverDrives to not work with Pockets. So Crix is pretty confident that those issues can be resolved on the Pocket side with a new firmware update. Up until now, Analog has been silent on this issue, so hopefully they can issue a firmware update to fix this. Zek Fu, the developer of that Game Boy Advance PCB revision, basically an entirely brand new Game Boy Advance PCB. They've also announced that there's a Game Boy Color version. There's a bunch of pictures here. It looks like they have support for a rechargeable battery, probably similar features to that Game Boy Advance version. It supports a USB-C recharging cable and completely redesigned audio circuits. This project is really awesome. However, I kind of didn't notice last time that there actually aren't any Gerbers or any files here related to actually making one of these yourself. So hopefully they update both the Game Boy Advance project as well as this Game Boy Color one so that people can actually start producing these for themselves if they want to. Unless their plan is to hold off and maybe sell them themselves, you know, that's understandable. But they haven't announced one or the other. Speaking of Zekfu, Zwenergy, who is the creator of the GBA HD Game Boy Advance consoleizer, they posted on Twitter that Zekfu has a GBA HD all-in-one shield. This project is absolutely ridiculous. It seems like it's an GBA HD shield that goes on top of that Spartan FPGA board, but it uses components of a Game Boy Advance. So you literally have to desolder some chips from a real Game Boy Advance PCB, put it onto this shield, and then essentially you don't have to solder or attach any flex cables to anything. This top shield part here has everything, the controller ports, the cartridge slot, the Game Boy Advance CPU, and all the ports, and it just interfaces directly with that Spartan FPGA board. There is a pretty lengthy bill of materials here, so this is definitely squarely in super advanced modding territory. I don't think you're going to be modding one of these yourself unless you have a lot of time and you're already pretty good at soldering and desoldering surface mount components. Still, I think it looks really awesome. I mean, this thing can't be that much bigger than a credit card. It would be pretty cool having a Game Boy Advance consoleizer, you know, only a couple of phones thick and being able to walk around with that. That's pretty cool. Speaking of really cool but also totally crazy projects, NeoTwig here shared that they have an upgraded version of their H. HDMI switcher called the Origin. From the tweet here, the Origin is an up to 25 port HDMI switcher that has a seven inch touch screen. This Origin HDMI switch is open source, so if you head over to the GitHub, you can see all of the supplies that you'll need to create on yourself. The switch is kind of modular, so you can have either five port, nine port, 13 or 25 port configurations, and you can have a 3.2 inch or a seven inch touch screen. But the real kicker to this project is it's actually made from other off the shelf HDMI switches. Switches. It says here you can use from one to six HDMI switches internally. NeoTwig has this interesting in-depth YouTube video going over all the features, such as the touchscreen interface. And if we keep watching, you can actually see what it looks like in the back. Like I mentioned, it's made from other HDMI switches, which are kind of matrixed together. And this project uses an Arduino to automatically switch between them using the Arduino. If we keep watching, we can see what it looks like inside. At the top here, you can see all of those HDMI switches, and they're all being routed to both the touchscreen here as well as the Arduino inside. My initial reaction to this project was kind of who the heck needs this? But then I realized that I actually have HDMI switches going into other HDMI switches right up here. So it doesn't really seem that crazy to just have a bunch of HDMI switches kind of matrix together. I would totally try this project except for that seven inch touchscreen 25 port model. The bill of materials costs over $500. We'll have to see if the cost of these parts goes down over time because I'm actually very interested with the amount of HDMI mods that I've got in the cabinet over there. 
Next, let's talk about Fraggle Rock and his SNES2 CDI controller adapter board. If we head on over to the GitHub, we'll see that this is actually an implementation of this or other original project here. This project uses an Arduino to basically just switch the inputs between a SNES controller and a CDI. However, the original project is just a wiring diagram basically showing that you can wire a SNES controller connector to the Arduino and then out to a CDI. It doesn't really have any physical implementation. That's where Fraggle's project comes in. He's created a little PCB that has the SNES controller mount as well as the CDI controller mount and a mount for an Arduino Nano. So in theory, all you have to do is order one of these boards, have a SNES connector, that CDI connector, and an Arduino Nano, flash the firmware on the Arduino Nano, and then you can have one of these working adapters. You can check out Fraggle's GitHub here for all the Gerber files, as well as all the parts that you're gonna need to put one together. Next, it looks like there's a new version of these GDMU clones that might have upgradable firmware. GDMU, if you don't know, is the Dreamcast ODE. In the past, the firmware on the clones was not updatable. Basically, you'd brick your GDMU clone if you try to update it. But it looks like there's a new version out now that might have upgradable firmware. From the comments on this tweet, though, it seems like the update process for the firmware is kind of complicated. But it looks like Modsville USA is going to buy one, so maybe he'll make a video about how to upgrade the firmware. It's also quite a bit more expensive than the older versions, so I'm not really sure if the trade-off is there. And finally, let's talk about this article that was posted on Video Game Perfection about the OSSC Pro. Long story short, it seems that the OSSC Pro has been delayed again, obviously due to COVID, but they did share with us that the case design has been finalized and they shared some renders with us. It seems that the OSSC Pro case has been designed by none other than Todd Gill, which is really awesome. They have some more renderings on their Twitter, and if we zoom in, we can see all the ports on the back here. Looks like there's a VGA port, component and audio input. Looks like maybe an optical audio output two HDMI ports, as well as the power port. And you can see a fan in the top as well. In the front, we can just see an SD card slot. There's some other holes here, but I'm not really sure what those are for. And in the side, we have what I think is a JTAG header on the left here as well as a SCART connector. So far, I'm a fan of this design. It's just a black box, and it doesn't need to be more complicated than that for me. The rest of the article goes through comparisons of the OSSC Pro and the RetroTINK 5X, as well as the Morph, but there's no real specifics there other than the OSSC Pro is using newer FPGAs compared to the RetroTINK 5X, and I'm assuming the Morph as well. I think it's a little bit too soon to talk about comparisons, especially since the RetroTINK 5X is the only one of those three that's currently available. But I'm curious I'm curious what you think. Did you buy a RetroTank 5X Pro already? Or are you holding off for either the Morph or the OSSC Pro? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. That's it for this week. If you want to suggest a new story to me, follow me on Twitter or join the Discord. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.